Okay, we're setting up another mic here, but anyway, aloha, and so, uh, Chef Johnny, aloha. Aloha. Nice for you both to come in today on this damp day on the North Shore and everywhere else, probably. <laughs> we're very pleased to be here, Tracy. Right. So, uh, Eat, Taste, Heal, an Ayurvedic cookbook for modern living. Um, Thomas Urema, medical doctor over at the Holistic Center. Daniel Rhoda, Ayurvedic practitioner. And Chef Johnny Brannigan, a collaboration of the three of you. And so, Daniel, you were saying this was like a three-year project for you. Yeah, it's been quite a journey, Tracy. Uh, it started about three years ago. actually began with requests by Dr. Urema's patients down in Kapa'a saying, can you please give us a guidebook and a cookbook? towards, uh, you know, bettering our health and particularly shedding a little insight into Ayurvedic medicine. So I came here from New York City, um, actually in a wheelchair. Um, I'd been working about 70-hour weeks at a Wall Street investment bank, and my health was rapidly declining, and I had this um, severe degenerative joint condition. You're so young. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I knew... (laughs) I knew I needed a complete lifestyle change, so I came to Kauai and I ended up working with Dr. Urema as patient and doctor. As my health began to improve, you know, I looked at this man's brilliant mind and I said, Dr. Tom, I really want to learn from you. What can we do together? And he saw that I had a background in writing, so he said, let's do a book together. And all we needed was an Ayurvedic chef and cosmic intervention intervened, I guess, and soon appeared Chef Johnny. So, Chef Johnny, when did you come onto the scene? Well, it was, um, if you believe in destiny, uh, Tracy, this is definitely one of those stories, I think, because I was actually living on the big island. I'd moved from Iowa, where I'd been, I'd been the chef in one of the leading Ayurvedic health spas in America, which is called the Raj. Now, that's where Dr. Suhas was working, right? Exactly. We we were working together. He was the medical director and I was the Ayurvedic chef. So we were collaborating there and um, Destiny, through, through an Irish lady from Princeville actually, came to that spa and she basically liked my food and invited me to Kwai. And as it happened, I landed on the Big Island and quite soon after that, about two months later, I visited Kauai because my best friend had flown from England and he'd landed on the wrong island <laughs> and he phoned me up and he said can you come pick me up from the airport and I said well you're on the wrong island <laughs> so he said well why don't you come over here and I said yeah, yeah that's a good idea so to cut a long story short I arrived in, in Lahui and I had a, a, a kind of a rough cookbook under my arm my first effort and I quickly heard about this Ayurvedic clinic in Kapa'a um, through um, a friend of mine that I was staying with, and she said, why don't you take your cookbook along there and see if they like it, see if you can sell it. And so I walked in and made an appointment, and I walked in and I had a really good feeling, and, and Tom Urema, the, the director there, came out to see me, and he said, yeah, we would like to write a book. And um, so I said, great, well, that's what I'm really into, you know, is writing Ayurvedic recipes. And so really, as I said, it was destiny. You know, we were destined to come together, the three of us. And this beautiful book, Eight Taste Here, is what has come out of that destined meeting <laughs> three years later. <laughs> well, it takes a while. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that again. <laughs> a long birthing process. Right, so go ahead. Just said it's been a long birthing process. Yeah, well, you know, most good things are, seems like takes time to create you know when you co-create especially when there's different people working together and everybody wants it all to be wonderful and and uh, you and you also had input from other people in the community for the book is that correct yeah we actually um we work quite closely with the folks at the blossoming lotus who as you know also wrote and published a wonderful cookbook um and just the alignment with kind of what we're doing and bringing consciousness about food and eating and what we put into our bodies. Um, It's been a wonderful place to collaborate on such a book. Uh, We also worked a little bit with GMO Free uh, Hawaii and Kauai for an extensive section on GMOs uh, that appears in the book. Now, for for listeners who aren't familiar with Ayurveda and Ayurvedic, perhaps um, I'll just invite each of you to sort of give your own personal definitions of 
Ayurveda. Of course, literally it means science of life. That's the literal translation. But, um, that's very good, Tracy. Well, I studied Ayurveda myself. No. The science <laughs> Not as of deeply life. as you two. A but. good student. <laughs> Yes, the the word science um, is translated from the word Veda, which many people are becoming more and more familiar with. And the Vedas is something that I've studied most of my life, and it is known to be mankind's oldest records of knowledge. And they basically describe all of the laws of nature in the universe, everything about your body, everything about how the body is related to the universe and to plants. And so... Ayurvedic healthcare and Ayurvedic cooking is one section of this vast body of knowledge. And it is the section which helps us really to fulfill the full potential of our body, of our mind, and um, basically enjoying a higher level of joy and bliss and energy on this earth, and maybe even living longer by attuning ourselves with the rhythms of nature and by using foods and herbs and a whole um, regimen really of, of daily routines can help you to live a much more balanced and fulfilling life and really enjoy what we would call 200% of life. So you don't have to you know, go and be a monk to enjoy this knowledge, you can actually integrate it into daily life with a bit of attention. Right. Let's talk a little bit, because it's an important part of Ayurveda, is um, the doshas. And people uh, can be, you know, usually it's always a combination of all three, but most people are, you know, lean towards one particular dosha that is more prevalent or prominent or maybe gets disturbed easier. <laughs> yes. So we could talk a little bit about the doshas and what they are and relation to Ayurveda. As Chef Johnny touched upon, when we speak about aligning ourselves with the rhythms of nature, we can look at any of the ancient traditions around the world, and most of them are rooted within the elements themselves that are found in nature. So Ayurveda identifies five primary elements in nature, those being space or ether, air, fire, water, and earth. And it observes that you know, we're essentially composed of the same elements that nature is composed of. So when we talk about air being within an individual, we can talk about the lightness of the body or the quickness of movement or the quickness of speech. When we talk about fire, we can talk about the metabolic activity of the body or someone with a very sharp, uh, determining mind, very goal-oriented. And this is where we start to understand a little bit about the doshas. So this first dosha, which we talk about, is vata, and it's a combination of the elements of air and ether. Pitta is the combination of fire and water, and then kapha is the combination of water and earth. Well, I mean, when I was first studying Ayurveda, I had a little bit of familiarity, familiarity with the Rudolf Steiner work, you know, with his ectom, ectomorph, endomorph, metamorph, which sort of relates in a little bit, of, you know, to the Ayurvedic as far as like the body types. And so, I mean, so it's interesting. I mean, of course, he, he kind of came up with this much later because Ayurvedic is about 5,000 years old. Yes. But, <laughs> but um, still, the Rudolf Steiner work is a, a lot of his is very, you know, esoteric and ethereal and working with herbs and plants and all kind of ties in. I mean, for you know, for people who are familiar with the Steiner work, it's kind of symbiotic, I think. Definitely. I mean, Steiner, it's such a vast body of wisdom also. And those three body types, it, there's a direct parallel within Ayurveda. When we talk about the Vata frame, which is thinner and more slender and willowy. maybe willowy, willowy in willowy. a prominence of uh, protruding joints and, and whatnot. And then the Pitta body frame is the, the medium body frame, which is often quite muscular. And then the kapha body frame are, you know, individuals that might be a little bit thicker in makeup, thicker bone structure, may have a greater propensity to put on weight, you know, compared to, say, a vata individual. Right. I um, also wanted to let people know the phone is open. If you have any questions, um, you can give us a call here at 826-7771. And so let's maybe talk a little bit about the taste, which, of course, <laughs> eat, taste, heal is a... <laughs> big proponent of any kind of cookbook so the different tastes and, and their signif you know what they signify in, in people's health chef johnny maybe we want to go take that one yeah i think that 
sounds like my uh, arena, Tracy. Um, tastes that we usually you know, identify with food, that commonly eaten foods, particularly like fast foods, would be sweet, sour and salty. Those are the main tastes that many of us eat a lot of. And Ayurveda is identifying those three and three others, which are bitter, pungent and astringent. And when we cook food Ayurvedically, the chef is really trying to include all those six tastes. And we would say that those six tastes bring balance to the body and they really nourish the different types of tissue in the body, um, of which there are seven different types of tissue. And so, you know, there is an attention and emphasis on including more bitter foods, uh, which are things like salad leaves and spinach and nice green herbs, you know, the things that we get a lot of on this side and chard and kale, which grow here. And then pungent foods, which would be more strong or heating foods like ginger and then peppers. Garlic. Garlic is, is certainly... Garlic's an interesting one because it actually has five of the six tastes in it. It's a very unusual food. Um, many foods are, are two tastes or even three, but garlic has five. And, um, yeah, so, and then the, th the other one, astringent. Now, this is the one that most people, like, kind of look quizzically at you when you say, well, what's that? What's that? What's astringent? And that really simply means a dry taste. And so all the foods, like lentils, legumes, beans, and actually honey and turmeric, they are astringent foods. And those... On those dry fruits like persimmons where it kind of dries your mouth. Puckers you know, your mouth. Puckers, that's <laughs> exactly, yeah. Puckers your mouth. And that they would be astringent. And so, and then there's the unofficial seventh taste, which we call, which is crunch. <laughs> and um, you notice when I came into your studio here, I brought you a, a little box which has a six taste meal in it. It does include some crunch, which is roasted pumpkin seeds Ooh. and sesame seeds. Um, so... So that's that's the six tastes, and we we you know, and the other three, sweet, sour, and salty. Of course, sugars and honey are sweet, but also um, all the like pasta, which is made of wheat and rice and grains. Many of the grains are sweet, and potatoes and all the dairy products, butter, cream, uh, you know, uh, they're they're sweet, and um, and then of course sweet fruits like mangoes and many fruits are sweet, and vegetables like. You know, zucchini and um, pumpkins, they're sweet. And then sour we get from things like yogurt and um, lemons and limes, of course. And then salt, which is from salt. <laughs> <laughs> the seaweed is, is very salty, of course, so that's a good, good example. Um, so if you can cook with some of those foods in, in your meals, pick some of those foods each time, you'll be cooking Ayurvedically. And the other thing that we, we look at in, in Ayurvedic cooking is not only the taste, but the quality of foods. So when we look at the quality of people, like a kapha person is, is generally heavier and, and slower and maybe calmer, and they would, should, would benefit from more stimulating and light and dry foods, because kapha, as Dan says, is made of earth and water. And so light, stimulating, heating foods are very good for them. Because a typical kaffir type behaviour would be like the couch potato <laughs> behaviour, <laughs> and, um, and um, they. Um, sorry, that's my telephone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you um, know, I, I got to tell you, I've never heard the same ring twice on cell phones. It's amazing. <laughs> Is this a caller? <laughs> um, well, we didn't give out your number yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> So, so then looking at the other qualities, a pitta person, they're often very focused because they're the, the, the hot and fluid type. So they're very kind of focused, organized people and very good at business and, and public speaking. And the quality of foods that they would benefit from would be um, cooling and um, quite, you know, they, they need to eat quite a lot of food pittas because they have this very strong digestion. And... Um, and then Vatas, the Vata types, are the sort of dreamy, spacey, disorganized types, the one who are always late for meetings. 
Uh, I could be describing myself here. Uh, <laughs> you are kind I'm, of, I'm glad he said it. <laughs> well, you are kind of willowy. You know? <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, we call it a slim year. Um, but yeah, vatas are often, often very slim and they move quickly. They're like the opposite of kaffirs, actually. So I'm sure that and they're often very creative, artistic. Um, you know, they're, they're often spiritual. So that's all me. <laughs> 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 and so they they would benefit from more grounding food. So this is really good news for us because they can eat cakes and cream, <laughs> cream and cakes. They don't gain weight. It's disgusting. No, and, uh, <laughs> and lots of and lots of sweets. <laughs> there goes my phone again. <laughs> this is unbelievable. They're probably ordering food. <laughs> um, so so and then the other thing that I haven't mentioned is that some. Um, those three types, the Vata Pittas and Kaphas, are balanced by three of the six tastes in particular. And this is very important to understand this. So if you are a Vata, you should really focus on sweet, sour and salty tastes. And then if you're a Pitta, you would focus on bitter, astringent and sweet tastes. And then a Kapha would focus on pungent, bitter and astringent tastes. And so, of course, there are combinations of, of, of types. So there are actually seven different types altogether if you, if you work out the combinations. And um, I, I think I'd like Dan to talk about those and how we, how we you know, feed that time. If you're, because you can be all three. That's true. But before we do that, I, just, I have one caller who asked a question. So, sure. And he would like to know, how does Ayurveda view meat eating and other animal products? as far as in their diet? It's actually a great question. Um, If you look back to classical Ayurvedic texts, they actually do include meat, um, particularly for medicinal purposes. And and there's also these old sutras talking about uh, feeding meat to to people going out into battle because it it, uh, excites the passions and and creates great strength and whatnot. So uh, oftentimes in, like, you know, the modern world Ayurveda is looked at as a strictly vegetarian science. And, you know, that's in part true, but it's also in part because it grew up alongside Hinduism in some parts. So Hinduism obviously, um, you know, abides by himsa in which no animal life is taken. So um, so to make a long story short, uh, Ayurveda does use in classical texts some meats. And, you know, what we say is, It's not about dogma. Everybody has foods that's going to make them feel good. Um, You know, some foods are going to do better for one constitutional type and not not for the other. Um, So what we'll find clinically is some people may come in um, and say, I'm eating meat three meals a day, you know, and I just don't feel good. So we work to lighten the diet. We work to potentially transition towards vegetarianism if that makes sense for that purpose um, and for that person. So in the book, um, the book is, I would say, a vegetarian book predominantly, but we do include um, sections on transitioning to a vegetarian diet. And we included a few recipes using organic chicken and fish. And that, in transitioning, that's going from very heavy meats, um, you know, pork and beef, into a lighter diet. Now, I know that... uh from my little bit of studying in Ayurveda, that ghee is often used. Now, of course, ghee is is a product of butter. I mean, it comes from cows. So, as far as other animal products, now, do you use ghee in any of your recipes? Is that something that... We certainly do, Tracy. Yeah, Yeah, we do use ghee, but you don't have to. Um, But we're using... I personally am using a mixture of ghee and coconut oil and some olive oil. But it all depends, you see, what your dosha is. See, a pitta person would benefit from a sunflower oil, which is more cooling, and sesame oil, which is popular, in, especially in Chinese cooking, Japanese cooking, and that's, that's quite heating. So that's better for the vatas, really, and, and, and maybe for kaffirs, although it's quite heavy. But anyway, um, yeah, so ghee is a wonderful food because it's said to be really good for the brain. And it also is extremely beneficial for the digestion and for the joints. And it has a great property that it carries the healing qualities of herbs deep into the tissues. And um, so we, we do value it. And also, it has, practically, it has a very high heating temperature. So it's great for frying spices and, and doing stir-fries, you know. And um, 
you know, it's it's really it does balance all three doshas actually. Although a kapha would probably less than a pitta and a vata, but it's sweet, you see, so it's very good for vata and pitta. And um, traditionally, dairy products have been described in the Veda as being very beneficial for developing consciousness, consciousness of the mind, and therefore that is that is actually one of the main reasons why the cow in India is is sacred because dairy products are very beneficial for developing your consciousness, your awareness. And just for people to, for, to clarify, mm. actually, ghee is clarified butter. And for people who don't exactly. know what ghee is. Yeah. <laughs> Good point, yeah, yes. It's very simply made by taking unsalted butter and boiling and then simmering it for about 20 minutes. And basically what happens is that the solid fats in the butter, they rise to the surface and then they sink to the bottom and eventually you can just pour off this wonderful amber-colored liquid. And that's your ghee. And you can keep it outside of a fridge. It doesn't go rancid. And it is valued. It's, it's actually valued not only in Ayurvedic cooking, but it's also valued in, in French cooking because it's used in sauces quite a lot. And um, so, you know, it, it is... As in, as in all of Ayurveda, these principles can be used universally. It's not just Indian cooking you know, in Kauai or in England, it's, you can use, basically, you, you, it's recommending that you use the foods that grow around you. So if you're in Italy, you know, you would be eating pasta and tomato sauces and lots of basil and, and oregano and, and lovely greens and beans, you know. And you can get the six tastes from those as well, you see. So Ayurvedic cooking could be a lovely dish of pasta, which is great for pitta and bata with a nice tomato sauce and greens, you know. And so we need to understand that, I think. And I think the book Eat, Taste, Heal has, has really helped to further that understanding that everyone can enjoy Ayurveda and not, not really be eating curries all day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Because when you were talking about Ayurveda, you are really talking about those six tastes, yes, which you can get yes. in other cultures and other types of food. Absolutely. So I just want to let people know, um, if you just tuned in, uh, this is Tracy bringing you Community Profiles, and I have special guests Daniel Rhoda and Chef Johnny Brannigan, and they are co-creators of Eat, Taste, Heal, an Ayurvedic cookbook for modern living. If you have any questions, the number here is 826-7771, and the gentleman who called earlier, please give us a call back, 826-7771. If you have any questions or comments, or maybe if you've been uh, using Ayurvedic principles in your life, you'd like to share um, the benefits of those. <sighs> and let's see, where are we going to go now? I was, um, oh, I know, even ghee is used medicinally, too, because I know when I took an Ayurvedic course, we used ghee for the neti basta, which is we yes. put the ghee in the eyes. You, we formed these little donuts out of dough and then poured the ghee in the eyes. And it was actually very medicinal. And even people who had, pro, you know, eyesight issues for a while anyway, their eyesight was perfect after the neti basta. I see that you have quite an inside knowledge of Ayurveda well, range. I'm so <laughs> impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me that before. Oh, well, yeah. I like to keep secrets, too. <laughs> I'm a Scorpio, so no one <laughs> <laughs> You know, Tracy, one thing I'd like to touch upon is in talking about the six tastes, one important thing is that the six tastes really represent a complete nutritional spectrum. So we talk about constitutional types doing better with three tastes and not so good with the other three tastes. But above that, it's great to have some of each taste in every meal that we make. That's, that's one of the underlying principles of Ayurvedic nutrition. And that's because the physiological properties of these six tastes, when we talk about bitter taste, bitter is one of the most cooling and alkalizing tastes. It's actually the best taste for detoxifying the tissues of the body, for lightening the tissues. Whereas sweet taste, on the other hand, when we speak about um, vata individuals who may have a very difficult time gaining weight, we want to build and nourish their tissues. So natural forms of sweet, like sweet sugars and things, not, not refined sugar, not refined white sugar, but right. <laughs> talking about honey and fruits and sweet potatoes. So there's just incredible wisdom within these six tastes, and they're in all food. So. I guess another thing I just want to clarify, too, is that the Indian cooking is not necessarily Ayurvedic. And so even though Ayurvedic falls under Indian cooking, everything that's Indian is certainly not going to be Ayurvedic. Some of the Indian food is not necessarily considered like balanced 
<laughs> as far as you're right, Tracy. Yeah, that is true. Um, I think that basically one does need to study the principles and understand them before you could say that you're cooking Ayurvedically. Um, I actually have a broader, you know, definition of what Ayurvedic cooking is, um, which maybe I could share that with you now, um, because I I do believe that first of all we we need to connect. The chef, let's say, needs to connect with the Veda itself. And the Veda, as we said, is the home of all the laws of nature. And it really describes what in modern physics is called the unified field, which underlies our own awareness and underlies the whole physical creation. And it's described as a field of unbounded silence, awareness. And um, before I learned Ayurvedic cooking, I, I trained uh, in meditation practice deep effortless meditation with the Maharishi which is called transcendental meditation and we learn from experience how one taps into an infinite source of creativity and peace and energy and quietness and deep rest which turned out to be extremely beneficial in um, improving and um, you know bringing bringing a wonderful feeling level and energy and that peace into the food. And I believe that's the real secret of Ayurvedic cooking, that the cook should be really in tune with that universal principle on the level of his own or her own experience. And that is really translated into the food because we do say that the most important ingredient in food is is love, the love that you put into it. And of course there are many definitions of love, you know, um, but the deepest definition that I feel, you know, I've come to understand is that everything is infinitely correlated. Everything, love is the most attractive force in the universe and everything is infinitely correlated. And therefore, when one starts to experience that unified fear in one's awareness and experience that one is actually everywhere, then that feeling goes into the food and people feel that. Many, many people on Kauai particularly have said to me, oh, your, your food sort of makes me feel high. It, it feels somehow special and they can't quite pinpoint it sometimes. I mean, some people of course can because people on Kauai are in tune with that unified feeling, many, many people. Um, and so that's one of the first principles I would say that makes an Ayurvedic chef. Or any chef, or, I mean, even if, when you're just cooking for your own family, I, I, I agree, it's like the love, when you put love into anything that you do, but especially in the food preparation, because mm. if love blesses blesses what we do, and so, of course, it's all vibrations, and, and that's going to emanate through every cell of the body. That's what we're talking about, exactly. And, and also, I mean, when we talk about Ayurvedic nutrition, um, we hear these adages, you are what you eat. I mean, that really extends to you are how you eat. How do you actually consume food? Are you grabbing something on the run and going down the sidewalk, chomping it down? Um, but the blessing of food, of course. You know, taking a few moments before you eat and to share food just to still the mind a little bit and to give thanks for the food. It's, you know, it's, it's a wonderful ritual that you can bring in in, in the most simple ways. Um, you know, when you eat is also considered very important within Ayurveda. You yeah, know. We t- let's talk about that a bit, because that is a, a huge part of sure. good health. Yeah, I mean, as Johnny said at the beginning, um, this working to align ourselves with the rhythms of nature, it's really a fundamental component of Ayurveda. So we look at the rhythms of the sun and the rhythms of the moon, and, you know, at high noon, the sun is at its peak. It's the hottest time of the day. And in the body, that's actually when the digestive fires, which we call agnis, those are actually primed to carry out their jobs most effectively. So eating the biggest meal of the day around noontime, you know, as they do in France and Spain and you know, many of these uh, European countries, it's considered optimal because the body is ready to digest it and to assimilate the nutrients better. And then, of course, to eat a smaller meal before you go to bed, you know, to chow down a big heavy meal with ice cream, you know, right before you go to bed, um, that leads to the formation of what in Ayurveda is called ama. Ama is considered the toxic byproduct of poor digestion. It's kind of this tissue sludge that builds up over time as food is not properly assimilated throughout the body. 
what one great way to see ama is if you wake up in the morning and look at your tongue there's a big white coating on the tongue and that's pure ama um so the time of day is considered very important um and then of course why why are you eating are you really hungry you know when we talk about comfort foods and you know maybe eating just because we think we need to eat at this certain time of the day um it's really important to enjoy the taste of food to actually salivate you want food so good that it makes you salivate you know you're literally feeding the senses it's the taste it's how it smells it's maybe how it sounds if it's crackling um you know we want to engage all of the senses that's very important right. i've just tuned in you're listening to community profiles kkcr and i have special guest daniel rhoda and chef johnny brannigan and they have co-created along with dr thomas urima eat taste heal an ayurvedic cookbook for modern living the number here is eight two six seven 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 one and the phone is ringing, so I'm going to grab that. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about maybe the gunas because and how how they um, correspond with you know the vasic, rajasic, and tamasic. And then we'll be right back with this question. We're, we're, <laughs> we're dealing with a pro here, Johnny Boy. <laughs> These questions. <laughs> so when we talk about um, the three gunas, as Tracy mentioned. Um, the three gunas are actually considered these three primal qualities of nature, namely sattva, rajas, and tamas. Sattva is the energy of purity, of light, of goodness, of cleanness. Um, rajas is more the energy of stimulation, activity, and movement. And tamas is the energy of inertia, dullness, or decay. Um, one example I often use is if you imagine yourself walking next to this beautiful crystalline lake and the sun is shining and the birds are singing and you're you know feeling the beauty of nature that's kind of this sattvic experience um rajas on the other hand i think of being in the middle of an urban center walking outside and being bombarded with sensory impressions and advertisements and you know there's stimulation and excitement but too much rajas can lead to burnout um and just an overactivity of the mind and then thomas is kind of the uh you know, the couch potato phenomenon that Johnny mentioned, and that's just this really not wanting to do anything, not really having the motivation. And um, when we talk about that in relation to food, um, the vibrancy of food is considered very important in Ayurveda. Um, so, of course, the organic foods movement, um, it's directly, directly aligned with it because the prana or the life force that is contained within food is what's going to give you prana and life force on some level. So sattvic foods are foods that are very, very high in energy. So fresh fruits and vegetables, of course. Um, you know, if you can buy them in season and locally, you know, go to your local farmer's market. That's considered wonderful. Rajasic foods are more stimulating by nature. Um, alcohol, of course, and, and um, you know, really hot spices and things that kind of stimulate the mind and the emotions and the make temperament you sweat. yeah they make you sweat <laughs> those are rajasic and then tamasic foods are actually very dull lifeless foods when we see all these incredibly processed and refined foods you know i think of the uh, the classic tv dinner which is miked in the new uh miked in the microwave <laughs> nuked in the microwave is i think what i was trying to say um but you know it's very dull and it's lifeless so if that's what you're feeding yourself with that's what you're going to get out of it aloha caller thanks for holding you on the air hi hi listen i wanted to ask the gentleman that came to Kauai to for the healing from the uh 70 hour a week job if it either he could relate to that on uh, on the radio here, or does he relate to it in the book as far as if you're in a situation that's similar to that, in other words, working in an office 40 to 50 hours a week and, you know, not having a lot of time and then how to deal with the the same thing that uh, every, you know, that people that come to them and have a vacation house on the ocean and get to get up in the morning and do yoga and, you know, be real sattvic in their life and, you know, you have a more uh, rajasic type life uh you know how how can how can you you know apply this i guess what i'd like to hear you know so he could you know uniquely talk about that from the position he was in 
Yeah, that's actually a great question. I mean, in my situation, being at such a debilitated state... Um, Listen, I'm going to just take my answer off the air if that's all right. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, being in that state, I realized that I needed to have a complete lifestyle change. So, you know, leaving the 70-hour weeks, you know, the whole Wall Street, New York scene, I, I needed to be somewhere, you know, beautiful and nurturing and healing. So I came to Kauai. You know, not everyone is going to be able to do that in their lives if they require healing. So um, one very important principle that it, it actually relates to what we were just speaking about with these rhythms of nature uh, is this element called dincharya, which is just the daily rhythm and the daily practice that one has in their life. Um, I talk to people all the time and they say, you know, I just don't have time to do anything. I don't have time to focus on myself and on my healing. And I say, you know, try by just taking 10 or 15 minutes in the morning when you wake up and, and, and you know, incorporating some gentle stretching or some meditation. And we actually, um, you know, Eat, Taste, Heal is it's half guidebook and half cookbook. So the first half is all about the, you know, the wisdom of Ayurveda. And then it also gives very practical tips of how to bring some of this into the daily life. But I feel that a good um, morning routine, even if it's five or ten minutes, it, it can completely change, you know, your disposition for the entire day. And then you may be more inclined to, okay, you can eat lunch at your desk, um, or you can consciously say, you know what, I'm going to take five or ten minutes away from that and, and I'm really going to sit and I'm going to enjoy my food and I'm going to try to maybe take a walk after lunch or I'm going to you know, work out at the end of the day. Um, I think it just really takes a commitment to finding those little windows throughout the day when we can focus back um, you know, to ourselves. And you know, Johnny being a meditation teacher, this is obviously something that he... He's very passionate about and sees um, value in, you know, finding that that just that balance really in everyday life. I mean, it is true too. Even if even if um, you only take ten or fifteen minutes a day to give your full attention to yourself and your well-being, it, it makes a huge difference. And I mean, I, so many people say, "Oh, there's just not enough time. There's not enough time." Of course, there's 24 hours in every day, so it's like it's it's a priority, it's choice that we make as individuals and in our family and our relationships. You know, how much time are we going to give to our own well-being? Absolutely, Tracy. I'd like to just comment on that for this for this uh, caller because, um, you know, I would say if you haven't got time to close your eyes for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, some point in the day. You're doing too much <laughs> because the importance of just allowing the mind to settle and experiencing peace, experiencing quietness, experiencing a state of mind that's not full of all these agitated thoughts and all these plans and ideas is so nourishing and it's absolutely crucial. Uh, Deepak Chopra was once asked, um, you know, we, we were very familiar with him as being a great pioneer of all um, complementary medicine systems. He was asked once, what, what would you suggest if you were going to recommend one thing that could improve somebody's health, you know, dramatically? And he said, meditate twice a day. And the reason for that is because during meditation, it's such a profound rest and you release stress and strain and tension. And your mind, which has, it does become kind of a bit dull, a bit lifeless from all these thoughts. You know, it's like 60,000 thoughts a day are pounding through your head. Most of them you had yesterday, the same ones. And when you reach this lovely level of silence and deep rest in the mind and the body becomes very still, you're hardly breathing sometimes, you're, you feel this quality of enlivenment and you could say almost blissful, almost divine feeling sometimes, just the pure enjoyment of this crystalline quality of the mind. And that just spills out into your daily life you know you start to be, be more friendly and you know mothers are more tolerant with their children and you know not flying off the handle so easily and, and you start to see the beauty in silly little things like blades of grass you know that you hadn't even noticed you know and um it, it's just such a wonderful refreshing thing so i really do recommend people to do that and that's really the beginning of ayurveda because you see ayurveda really mirrors the sequence in creation there's a sequence in creation of how the creation manifested and it started off with pure silence. And out of that comes the five elements, the five senses, and the mind, the intellect, the ego. And this is what makes up a human being. 
and and the, th- and the three gunas which are equivalent to the mind and the intellect and the ego this makes up the physical universe and man or woman <laughs> is made in the image of the of the divine of the universe we're like we're a macrocosm a microcosm in the macrocosm and so when we settle down the mind and experience this infinity unboundedness we are tuning ourselves with the basic rhythms of nature and creation and then after that we can unfold the details which would be you know things like what time do we get up in the morning you know because we know from Ayurveda that there are actually times in during the day every four hours the dosha changes in the in the day so at six o'clock in the morning we're actually ending vata time which started at two in the morning and we're beginning kapha time so it's recommended that you actually get out of bed, if you can do this, before <laughs> kapha time starts, before that heavier influence of kapha starts to influence you, makes you want to sleep for another two hours. <laughs> and then you, you wake up bright and, and you're more fresh. And as Dan was saying, you know, pitta time is starting at 10 o'clock in the morning and, and 10 o'clock at night. And um, so that's a great time to have your lunch sometime after 10, you know, 10, 11, 12, more, more towards midday when it's really its highest. And again at night, when you're going to bed, we, Ayurveda is recommending get into bed before 10, before pitta time starts, before that heated active time. And also this is very important for health because in that time you metabolize toxins in the body very efficiently if you're asleep. And it's really a very rejuvenative time for the body. And they've always said this is like folklore, you know, that an hour before midnight is actually worth two afterwards. So if you get into bed before 10, you get to sleep. And by 12 o'clock, you've already slept for four hours, <laughs> you see. And, That's you know, how you can get up at six. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this is what we mean by attuning ourselves with rhythms of nature. And then after that, you know, we can add other little things like we do a little bit of yoga exercise in the morning or some of those... Surya Namaskar, the sun salutations that people do, those can be done very quickly, you know, just stand up, do a few of them, and it changes the body, it changes the way you feel. And then, as Dan was saying, eating in the evening, eating sensibly, you know, don't eat a pizza at 10 o'clock and then go to bed and expect to wake up feeling fresh, because you won't. Maybe you can get away with it once when you're like 80, but <laughs> you keep on doing it, it's going to dull you. And so we eat light at night, and we go to bed early, and then we get up fresher in the morning. And it already unfolds from awareness. That's why I emphasize the meditation practice. It unfolds from your awareness. Are you aware of what you're eating? Are you aware of where the foods came from? You know, Do you go to your supermarket and buy foods that you don't really know where they came from? You don't know what the farmer did? Or do you go to the market and you meet the f- farmer and you, you talk to him and say, yeah, you know, you're growing this organically and what does that really mean? You know, What is organic food? And What's the effect of it on your body? You know, these are important questions that you start to become aware of. And this is also how we become aware of our environment. You know, one of our key issues in this present modern day world is our environment. You know, it's, well, I'm not going to go into how frightening it is, but it is frightening. (laughs) What's actually happening? And we've had lectures about it in Kauai, you know, from very eminent people talking about how whole the whole barrier reef, coral reef is going to be disappearing in like 20 years or something and all these th- amazing things like a piece of um, the Arctic, the ice in the Arctic broke off recently which was the size of a state in America and you, they showed it in a satellite picture and it just broke off and this, these sort of things, these are a reflection of us, of our bodies the environment is like an extension of our body but to understand that we need to have awareness we need to have the awareness of how big we really are and um, this is another thing, how we can help to improve the environment by improving ourselves. And this is very much part of Ayurveda. If you improve your own life, how you, you know, you could be growing food in your garden and not going out to buy it. And, and you'd be loving that food and think, oh, look how beautiful that carrot is, look how beautiful that bok choy is that I've grown. And then you take it into your kitchen and you're chopping it up and you're eating it and making a salad or, or you know, making a soup. And this is what, Awareness brings, it brings this sensitivity to ourselves, to our own needs, to nature. And so there's a very holistic development which is going to happen by following the simple principles of Ayurveda. It's so very basic and so all 
comprehensive, you know, that in, in the end, you see, we really follow it. Like myself, I haven't been to a doctor since I was probably about 18. I started meditation when I was 16. I don't get headaches that I used to get, you know. I don't get um, pains and things like that I used to get. And, and they've actually shown, research has shown that people who practice, you know, these routines, meditation and Ayurveda, they can often have 50% less illness after a year or so of doing it. And this is very, very significant. You know, you can lower your own blood pressure. You can, um, you know, cure insomnia. You can get rid of anxiety. You can get off the dependency of, of, of using cigarettes and alcohol and, and drugs. Many, many things you can actually do. And so in the end, you won't need to go to a doctor. You won't need be dependent on a doctor. You won't have to pay all these incredibly expensive bills because you'd be taking care of your own health, your own happiness, your own state of balance and, and, and well-being of your mind and it's you're doing it yourself and it's you know you're not really having to pay for a lot of it and that's one of the main even um functions of ayurveda in india i mean people they it, it's it's their lifestyle and i i know there's like certain times of the year when the seasons change they do a pancha karma or some type of cleansing to keep their cells stronger because as the seasons change, that's when the the body's immune system weakens a little bit. And and I mean, you know, and in, of course in India, a lot of people cannot a afford health care, and right. so they really do take care of themselves as best they can, and and they do a lot of this through the principles of Ayurveda. If you just tuned in, you're listening to Kauai Community Radio. And I have special guests Daniel Rhoda and Chef Johnny Brannigan who have co-created Eat, Taste, and Heal, an Ayurvedic cookbook for modern living along with Dr. Thomas Urema. And um, let's maybe talk about where the book's available for people who are listening. And also, I know, um, Chef Johnny, you actually prepare Ayurvedic food and would like to invite you to give out your phone number if you would like to do that. Of course. Thank you, Tracy. Yes, um, I... I'm actually delivering food three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And of course, I do catering for people, you know, for different events, which is all Ayurvedic catering. And um, they just really have to phone, yeah, my number six three four two five six five. And I'm mainly delivering meals in the Kapa'a area in Wailua. Um, but if it's, you know, people can order uh, for the whole family, I'll travel further. And the book, uh, the book was actually just released nationally, um, not even a month ago. Congratulations! Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, it's available on the island, um, of course, at our clinic, Kauai Center for Holistic Medicine, which is located in the Dragon Building. Um, in Kapa'a. In Kapa'a, right above the wonderful blossoming lotus, and uh, we, of course, um, you know, offer a full full service of Ayurvedic treatments. Um, we have an Ayurvedic academy called the Loha Ayurvedic Academy directed by the wonderful um, Ayurvedic physician Suhas Kashir Sagar. Um, the book is also available, let's see, on the North Shore, it's at uh, Savage Gourmet, which is right in the main shopping plaza in Hanalei. It's available at Borders and the Hui, um, and of course on our website, uh, eattasteheal.com, along with a few recipes, and you can kind of see the book and um, you know on Amazon and any, any of the big uh, e-retailers online. Mm. Papayas? Did you mention papayas? Oh yeah, yeah sorry, papayas, papayas and uh, kapa'a also has a papaya, right. And perhaps we could talk a little. We only have about seven more minutes. So, um, I always, when I cook, I always love to include uh, lots of colors in my food. So maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, colors. I mean, I don't know if it really is is part of Ayurvedic or not, but I'm sure <laughs> I see the thumbs up over there. Because, <laughs> um, I, I, of course, they believe in the vibrations of colors and different colored food is going to bring different vibrations. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that. I think that's an interesting question for me, Tracy, because I was originally trained as a fine artist, as a painter. And that's what I was doing just before I, you know, traveled to Switzerland and, and met the Maharishi and started training as an Ayurvedic chef. And um, I've seen a definite correlation between painting and cooking because cooking is so wonderfully colorful and um, of course color is, is is a healing thing in our lives you know we choose clothes which we we're attracted to and you know when we see a rainbow that's a healing experience in itself is it not you know to see those beautiful celestial colors and color can be used very similar to the way taste is used actually because 
you know, we're looking at cool colors and warm colors and earthy colors, you know. So a vata person, you know, is going to be really balanced by nice soothing warming colors like a lovely warm green you know and and you can extend this to nature you know in the, so walks green lo- walks for in lovely green green land is very good for pitta and walk in moonlight is very good for a pitta which is i guess a a, a white creamy sort of light <laughs> and then um kaffirs as i said they're the more you know they tend to be a little bit slow get slow to get going so they need the, like the stimulating like the fire engine red and orange you know and we we've actually used these colors in the book deliberately you'll see in the book that we've used color coding for all the recipes and so we have um a lovely sort of bright orange or, or burnt orange for kaffir and then for the vata we have this warm green and then pitta has this kind of lovely soothing cooling a uh, lilac and so so color and, and it's also used in in gems gemstones bring color which is very healing in ayurveda and um you know the way we decorate our um our environment our house you know so you know colors are recommended like in the bedroom it's recommended to have um pictures of of water and blues and which is calming you know and and perhaps in the in the dining room or the living room there'll be like more stimulating like yellow and orange which stimulate digestion stimulate conversation um so there's many 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 ways which we use color. i i actually find when i look at my when i'm cooking you know because i haven't i cook outside in my garden actually because i like to be outside and have the fresh air when i look at the dishes that i prepare and i see all these incredible colors of beetroot and purples and red and yellows of the saffron and turmeric and oranges it is like looking at a canvas, like a modern canvas. It's, it's absolutely beautiful, you know. So it is a very healing part of it. Absolutely, very good question. And actually, one uh, one kind of subliminal way we brought color into the book is we worked with a phenomenal food photography team in Los Angeles to do the book. Um, the photographer actually has won an award for his photos in this book, uh, a Maverick Award. So when we were there doing the shoot, we decided that you know, we actually want to plate the dishes and create, you know, backgrounds and sceneries that correlate with the balancing colors of the doshas. And, of course, you're balancing through opposites. So we weren't plating pitta balancing dishes in fire engine red. We were doing it in more cooling colors. And it's just kind of a subtle, you know, subtle detail we put in the book, but something that definitely related to the color aspect. Excellent. So if you just tuned in, we're talking about Eat, Taste, Heal, an Ayurvedic cookbook for modern living. We have Daniel Rhoda here, spent three years um, in collaboration with Thomas Urima, Dr. Thomas Urima, and Chef Johnny Brannigan. Although, now Chef Johnny, did you, what, what part in the three-year history did you come into this picture? Were you in the very beginning of the process? or? Yeah, more or less. Uh, they They hadn't really got going when I arrived and um, I think it just coagulated coalesced catalyst well, yeah catalyst well, well, <laughs> yeah the three of us I always said when we had our first meeting I think was we I remember we, we meditated and um, I said to them to Dan and Tom I said this is going to be bigger than all of us this book and I think that's safe to say that is true you know it's been very well received by critics and by the professional you know health world and 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 food world and it's really because it's I think it's always about timing and the coming together of three minds and, and really when we you know when I've asked Tom, Tom and Dan what, what, what are your goals in life they're the same as mine and that is really to bring the knowledge of the profound knowledge of life and healing to as many people as possible and, um, and that's what I think the book is going to help to do to, to really help to educate people and, and make it more simple to, to live a life which is a life of fulfillment and health without reliance on, you know, too many unnatural um, foods and chemicals. And uh, it's so much more than a cookbook. I just want to let people know it it's a, has a lot of information about Ayurveda itself, about the different doshas that we've been talking about. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's a wonderful textbook, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, and it's also very beautifully done. And so if you have... Um, if you always wondered, because Ayurvedic has gotten to be a lot more, what we say, in vogue. <laughs> mm. I mean, Deepak Chopra did bring it out a little bit more, I don't know, how was it, 15 years ago, maybe. Yes. But um, uh, it's definitely 
being talked about, being utilized a lot more here in the in the, the West. As we said before, it's a 5,000 plus year old system from India. But this book, it's it's once again just like the Blossoming Lotus book is beautiful photography, and obviously a lot of heart and consciousness has gone into the preparation of this book and, of course, the preparation of all the recipes. And as I talk, we only have like one more minute. But um, so are some of these recipes, recipes that you've come up with yourself or some of these that you've learned in Ayurvedic uh, when you were studying Ayurvedic cooking? I'm sure it's probably a little blend of everything, but... Chef Very much. I think it's really a blend of my life's experience as, a, as an Ayurvedic chef. Um, I, I mean, I certainly... You know, we put together the recipes ourselves. They're all m- my own recipes. But um, the influences are, are are from all around the world. And um, they a lot of the recipes um, are very are suitable for vegans and people on a gluten-free diet. We've really tried to cover everybody's tastes, actually. You know, so there's fish and chicken dishes in there as well. And um, But basically, they're easy to digest. They're very delicious, and they're balancing Ayurvedically, and there's something for everyone. And it's a simple introduction for people to start cooking in a healthful way for the whole family. And well, both Daniel and uh, Chef John are examples of uh, Ayurvedic, uh, the the powers of the Ayurvedic philosophy and way of life through healing and through your food and through awareness and consciousness you're both vibrant like if you can't see because you're not it's just listeners I just want to let you know they're both very vibrant and here is as, as Daniel said he came to Kauai in a wheelchair and now he's probably out surfing the waves <laughs> when he has time <laughs> between his uh, touring of the new book so Thank you, eat, Trace. eat taste heal an Ayurvedic cookbook for modern living and so much more really gives you a lot of foundation of the Ayurvedic principles and if you like to taste some Ayurvedic food Food that uh, Johnny lovingly repair, re- prepares. <laughs> he repairs you with his preparation of food. <laughs> A little tongue twister there. Anyway, um, Johnny can be uh, reached at 634 2565. And the cookbook Eat, Taste, Heal, an award winning book, can be purchased at the Kauai Center for Holistic Medicine, which is in the Dragging Building in Kapa'a, at Papayas in Kapa'a, at Savage Gourmet in Hanalei, at Borders in Lahui. You can also find out more through their website, www.eattasteheal.com. Thank you so much, Daniel and Johnny, for taking time out to come and share with us. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you, Tracy, for a lovely interview. Thank you. Well done. Aloha. Aloha.